welcome to the Digital Buzz Studios. I'm Dave Plow. This is Fails and Fixins. How y'all doing today? Hope everything's going well. I want to point something out to you before we really dive into things. And that thing is right back here, all the way back there. You might see it, you might not. That is an audio mixer. And I'm pointing it out to you because last week we weren't here doing a live broadcast. But what we did do was a podcast. So if you're not already subscribed to us, Fails and Fixins, at Spotify, at iTunes Store, over on the Google Podcast app, wherever you get it, if you're not already with us, then you should be sure to get with us because in the future, these studios here, we're moving. It's not going to be next week. It's not going to be the week after that. But here in the near future, we're packing up and moving out. And when we do that, it's going to be about probably four to five weeks of nothing but podcasts. And we have a great lineup. I've already, I've worked ahead. This is something that those of you who have worked with me in the past at some of my IT jobs or in the news would not believe. But things change. People change. I work ahead now. I plan things now. It's crazy. This is all part of the gig. Speaking of the gig, let's start talking about what's going on right now. And that thing that we're talking about this week would be Microsoft and the Internet Explorer. It sounds super interesting to you all, I'm sure. But the Internet Explorer has been around since, not since the beginning of the Internet. Obviously, we all know Al Gore created the Internet. That's what he said. But it's been around since the late 90s. In fact, the Internet Explorer came baked in to versions of Windows following... There was Windows 3.1, there was Windows 95, there was Windows 98, and there was uh, Windows Vista, XP, blah, blah, blah. Well, starting about that Windows 99 era, if I remember right, Internet Explorer was a baked-in part of Windows. In fact, if you're running any version of Windows right now, you can search for Internet Explorer, and it's in there. And in the beginning, you couldn't uninstall it. And that led to some antitrust lawsuits against Microsoft because... In the beginning, around that time, the internet was huge and browsers were huge and everyone knew this. In fact, I just want to go ahead and point out that there is a series uh, directed by Nat Geo involving Fox and it was called Valley of the Boom. A very interesting, very fun look back at the browser wars and something that was super important that you probably didn't know was going on at the time. However, we're not here to talk about the other browsers. We are only here to talk about Internet Explorer. So people didn't like Internet Explorer because it was getting bad press from this antitrust suit and because it was not a great browser. It didn't stick to the guidelines established by the World Wide Web Consortium. That is the organization which establishes standards for web technologies. By Internet Explorer not sticking to those guidelines, developers had to work under a different special set of rules just to make their websites and their apps, well, now we know them as apps, work with Internet Explorer. So that was a pain for the developers, but it was a pain for the users too, because Microsoft was always slow to patch security flaws and other upgrade-ish issues that would pop up with an Explorer. So Internet Explorer 1 and 2, kind of a disaster, bad start. We all know that bad starts, bad first impressions can ruin what people think of you, can ruin how people see you. But Microsoft, to their credit, realized there were problems. So Internet Explorer versions 3 through 6 made a lot of progress. They were, innovated, they, te- they were innovative. They tended to work upon deployment. And Microsoft actually started building a little bit of momentum with them. People started switching over. Or people that just didn't know they could go download a different browser were using Internet Explorer. And then it was hard to sway them off because Internet Explorer was reasonably good. So that's versions three through six. But Microsoft started to lose some market share. These other browsers that had already kind of been around were starting to really make pushes, things like Firefox and Opera. Now, from the beginning of 2008 through 2009, Internet Explorer's market share dropped nearly 8%. During that same period, Firefox's grew nearly 28%. Now, it's easy if you're an upstart that people are excited about for your market share to grow because you start at zero, so you've got nowhere to go but up. However, 
there are numbers that indicate this was a pure, a lot of that 28% was a pure switching from Internet Explorer to Firefox. Firefox was the browser of the day. I can remember back then, I was a Firefox guy. That's all I used. And it didn't help that during this period, they launched Internet Explorer 7, and it was a disaster. Its install required a full computer reboot, so people would download it and install it, and then their computer had to reboot, and if they were using a different browser, they didn't want to go use that one again. It was also continued their history of being not standards compliant, which is not only a problem for developers, but it's a problem for users, especially by the time we get to 08, 09. People have an idea of what the internet is and how it was supposed to look, and Internet Explorer 7 was not delivering. So no one wants to use a browser that doesn't work on the websites they visit, right? I don't. I know you don't. And there were a good number of websites that just simply chose not to use it, kind of as was the problem with Internet Explorers 1 and 2. The reason, or at least part of the reason why, Internet Explorer wasn't new. It just recycled a lot of the code that they had from Internet Explorer 6. I know that's a little geekery, but the fact is, instead of being innovative, they just said, hey, we've already got this stuff. Let's bring it in. What didn't work before might not work now. So they just didn't care. And it was really Microsoft's chance after the momentum they built 3 through 6. It was their chance to kind of make a splash and get back into things. And said they just flushed it and continued their descent into browser hell. What's their solution? I've got an idea what my solution would have been. However, Microsoft, they went a different way. Instead, they released, instead of doing what I would have done, I should say, they released Internet Explorer 8. So they kept the name and everything, but Internet Explorer 8, March 19th, 2009. Internet Explorer 8 was, surprisingly, a very good browser for the time. It had improved tab usage, which tabs were a thing that popped up between Internet 7 and Internet 8. Uh, You all know what tabs are today, but back then we had no idea how useful they would become. And what they did was they color-coded the tabs. So if if you're on the Fails and Fixing site and I have a link to something, you click on that link, well, it opens up a colored tab that matches the fails and fixing. So you know these sites are related, these tabs are related, and it continues to do that. So if you're a blogger, or if you're someone like me who's doing a lot of research, that's incredibly helpful because you know this page leads to this page leads to this page. These are all connected to this thing that I'm writing about, to this thing that I'm doing. So that's a pretty great feature. There were other great features too, like the smart screen filter. This let users know when they were entering into a website known to harbor malicious software. So malware, if you're going to a site that may be a little sketchy, but you need to go to it anyway, or you think you do, or you're just super interested in the link you're clicking, well, it has a pop-up that says, yo, bro, probably not a good idea. And then you have to decide how much you really want that information or whatever it is you're consuming. It also had an improved address bar. Something we take for granted today is that if you type in the address bar across the top, you say, I want fails and fixings. Then Google, or if you don't know what you're doing, Bing will pop up and it'll give you search results for what you want. Well, Internet Explorer 8 was the first browser to do that, where you could set what search engine you wanted it to use to search when you typed in the address bar instead of taking you straight to a website. Those features are pretty great. Those are awesome features. However, the thing that really set it apart, the thing that they really marketed on, and the thing that people kind of like to make jokes about, Internet Explorer 8 was the first with a little thing called in-private browsing. If you don't know what in-private browsing is, well, let me tell you. In-private browsing is now known as incognito or private browsing. This is when your screen goes black and whatever you do doesn't get recorded within your computer. So at the time, people made fun of it, calling it porn browsing, which I'm sure a person or two used it for that. So that was Internet Explorer's, that was Internet Explorer 8's big hook, and it released well. People checked it out. Tech nerds like me downloaded it. We were like, all right, we'll give Internet Explorer another chance. Guys that use Internet 7 were excited to upgrade because it was garbage, and within a week, It was doing very well, but by the end of that week, its numbers had not only leveled out, but were dropping. 
Why were they dropping? Because the only people actually checking it out were the people who were stuck using Internet Explorer 7 and those of us who were nerds that just wanted to check things out. What is Microsoft to do when they look at these numbers and they realize, oh my gosh, we peaked in a week? Well, they do what any normal company would do, and they started a campaign, a marketing campaign, an ad campaign, a PR campaign, whatever you want to call it. I'm not totally sure how we classify this particular campaign, but it was neat. I think it was neat. It was the Browse Better campaign, and it started uh, kind of towards the end of June, the beginning of July. I've seen various start dates for it, but I'm going to go ahead and guess that it started kind of the very end of June. And it was created by an Indianapolis-based agency, Bradley and Montgomery, who had already done a very successful Mojave campaign for Microsoft. Not something we're going to talk about on here because we talk about the things that fail, but a very successful campaign for Microsoft. And it consisted of web-only PSA-type ads. So they were public service announcements, and they were directed by Bobcat Goldweight. If you don't know Bobcat or you just kind of recognize the name, let me tell you. He's the director of films such as World's Greatest Dad, God Bless America, and Willow Creek. If that doesn't do anything for you, then he starred in the iconic film Scrooged, the Mr. Ed-esque Hot to Trot, and most notably Police Academies 2, 3, and 4, where he played Zed. He's the guy that talks kind of like this and acts kind of crazy. That's... Bobcat. In these ads, they starred Superman. Not like Superman, like um, whoever, Brandon Roth or Channing Tatum or whoever plays Superman these days. We're talking Superman of the 90s, Dean Kane. If you don't know him as Superman, maybe you know him from Ripley's Believe It or Not. However, they starred Dean Kane, and they were all based around web problems that were somewhat unique, but everyone could relate to. And each of these web problems had an, were given an acronym that Dean would explain. So, for instance, one of them was shyness, S-H-Y-N-E-S-S. And it meant sharing heavily, yet not sharing still. And the campaign, or that particular ad, was based around a lady who posted a lot of things to Facebook, probably too much, but it ran too slow for her to post everything she wanted to post. And her coworkers we're not able to block her stuff quick enough. So it was showing how internet explorer is quicker. So it solves both of your problems. And then another one was uh gripes, G R I P E S gritting rage, internet, pathetically extra slow. That one's hard. And that one was an old guy in his living room, like banging on his computer, complaining about how slow his internet is. And his grandson pops up and then Dean came pops up and they explain how internet explorer eight fixes this issue. Now, there were two other ones. There was FOMES, which is fear of missing something. A lot like FOMO, which came afterwards, so we'll we'll withhold judgment. And then OMG IGP, which we're going to talk about extensively here in a moment. Now, all these different ads directed you to the site browseforthebetter.com, which no longer exists. And Microsoft promoted that for every copy of Internet Explorer 8 downloaded, from that website between the start of the campaign, which was, like I said, around June 30th, to, the, to Microsoft 8, Microsoft was going to donate eight meals to Feeding America, which is a domestic hunger relief charity. Pretty cool, huh? Like, you're okay, I can download this browser, and Microsoft automatically makes a donation. We've got these commercials directed by this great comedian who has gone on to have a very neat, movie career if you're a film buff and everything should work out right right well this campaign lasted less than a week what happened so the omg igp video involved a guy browsing the web passing the computer to his wife when she asked for it she looks she presumably looks at his history and she vomits all over the floor and this isn't like she just goes this is they shot it because it's bobcat he shoots the vomit, good amount, coming out of her mouth, hitting the floor. And then Dean Kane walks in, says a few words, and then her husband comes walking and he's like, honey, what happened? And he slips in it. To which she then ends up vomiting again on him. Kind of gross, kind of a bit of a gross out humor thing. 
personally, I thought it was kind of funny, but I can definitely see why not everyone would. So, OMG IGP stands for, oh my god, I'm gonna puke. And the ad was to promote the in private browsing for if the husband had been using it, the wife would have never vomited and Dean Kane would have had to have shown up. And the ad, according to Microsoft, was meant to be tug in cheek and use irrelevant humor. Those are Microsoft's quotes. However, Microsoft apparently got a lot of backlash. And if you do a search for this particular campaign, you'll see tons of argue, you'll see tons of articles arguing that Microsoft had to resort to gross out humor just to get people to pay attention to the Internet Explorer. Which, I mean, they kind of did. It, the Explorer was dead at the time. So Microsoft uh, put out a quote that said, with much of the feedback to this particular piece of creative was, while much of the feedback to this particular piece of creative was positive, some of our customers found it offensive, so we removed it. This ad was up for about two days. You can find it online, and in fact, we're going to link to all four of these ads in the comments section so you can check it out. But Microsoft pulled that ad. Uh, by the end of the campaign, they pulled all of the ads and erased the site. However, they had already made this promise to Feeding America. So what they did was they literally doubled down on it. They extended the they extended the deadline, and they said, all right, now instead of donating four meals, we're going to donate eight meals. So they tried to do a little bit of spin and PR after they received some backlash for this particular ad. What would I have done? How would I improve this? Well, personally, I liked the ads. Uh, I even, the OMG IGP was over the top. I might have asked Bobcat to refilm it to make it a little less zoomy, gross outy type thing. But I thought the ad overall was pretty solid. So maybe what I do is I go ahead and I release gripes, which I thought was very funny. Uh, gripes, shyness, and foams. And then I have Bobcat, while those are being released, I have Bobcat redo the OMG IGP. After he redoes it and we get a little less explicit version of it, which who knows, maybe it would have been worse. Maybe it would have been better. Bobcat's a great director and very interesting type dude. So maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't, but I get a different version of it so that I can release it as a second wave of promotion, especially if they knew ahead of time, they were going to extend that feeding America thing. I couldn't find out if they did or not, but if they knew ahead of time, they were going to extend it. You throw it out there on the beginning of that to create a second wave of interest, to create a second wave of articles, people going, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I can't believe what just happened. So I release it then and change it, or you simply don't release it at all. That's how I fix this campaign because browse for the better is a good campaign slogan. Most of the three of the commercials, there's nothing offensive about and are pretty entertaining. Dean Kane is surprisingly good at a deadpan. So maybe even, okay, like I said, we have Bobcat refill OMG IGP. We might even extend it. So we say, okay, refilm this one, but also give us two more. And we create a whole nother deal. So we have a second wave of this campaign. Instead of what they did was they put up OMG IGP out first and the other three ads. I know one of them got put up online, but the rest did not. So we never even saw them until years afterwards when this became something of a case study. So that's what I do. What would you do? I want to hear what you would do. So comment on this video on our Facebook page. Shoot me an email at Dave and Fails and Fixins. Let me know what ideas you have on how to fix this failed campaign. And that's all I got for this week, guys. Thank you for hanging out with me for these past 20, 25, 15 minutes. Wow, that was a short one. Thank you for hanging out with me for these past 15 to 20 minutes. And I will see you next week when I come at you with another fail and another fix.